Okay, well, thank you very much for coming along. Um, my name's Quentin. This is work mostly with, uh, collaboratively with Beth Simon in uh, California, um, but recently Greg Michelson and Harriet Watt University and folk from the Scottish Qualifications Authority have also been contrib uh, contributing, and we'll see that aspect uh, towards the end of the talk. Okay, so cognitive apprenticeship. Uh, I want to talk about uh, apprenticeship and programming. Programming often gets you know, we sort of query about whether it's a, a science or an engineering discipline or a craft or an art and all those kind of things. So I want to just d draw those ideas out more at the craft end. Um, and then how does, how does that relate with industrial teaching, which, you know, we're all sort of... We're, we don't really do apprenticeship. What we do is some other form of teaching, um, where, which typically involves lots of people in a room with one or maybe more... Uh, instructors of some kind. Um, so is that is that a problem? If I think of programming as, as uh, a craft discipline, um, what what are the issues with our current pedagogies? Uh, I want to talk about a programming pedagogy that I think does make use of pr apprenticeship in some some form, um, and that's going to lead into something called the abstraction transition taxonomy, uh, which I think is a very useful framework for thinking about the skills that we're trying to develop in programmers, um, which after all is what apprenticeship is all about. Apprenticeship is all about developing skills in people and um, I think this taxonomy helps us think about the skills uh, that we're trying to um, bring forward in, in our students. And then I want to talk about how all of this work is having an effect in Scotland. Um, quite a big effect, I think. Okay, so uh, apprenticeship, I suggest, um, is, is really used when um, we're trying to learn more than just basic facts, or uh, we're trying to learn more that skill. We're trying to learn more than just skills that can be codified using a set of rules. Yeah, if we can actually rigorously apply a set of rules, and we can just simply learn those rules, then kind of the typical ways we go about teaching work fairly well. And you could think about things like simple arithmetic. We are just for following quite straightforward rules, or. The physics community in universities got quite upset when they realised that to do mechanics problems, the, the students were just following a set of rules. And they were, it was just like turning the handle for physics problems. Does that make sense? I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? We, we all know about that, that kind of thing. And what the physics people were upset about was that the students didn't really think like physicists. Because that's not what a real physicist does. They, they understand the problem much more deeply, and sure, they pick out of the box the appropriate formula to use and all that kind of thing, but they're, they're not just doing it by rote. But what they realized was that A-grade students were getting A-grades because they were just applying rules in a mindless way. And so that was when their sort of bells started ringing, going, my God, this isn't really what we want. Um, yeah, the funny thing, um, Eric Mazur, who's a, a big player in this light, you know, he, he, he applied a set of questions to the students to find out whether they could think like physicists or whether they could just turn the handle. And it turned out that even he's in Harvard. And it turned out that even his students were just, you know, in fact, just, just turning the handle. You know, he'd started off by saying, oh, but surely not my students. Oh, sadly, his students as well. Um, so I, I'm sort of, you know, I'm thinking about all these kind of areas like music or, I don't know if that's a word, chefing, you know, when you start off in a kitchen, you know, you start off washing the dishes, but you're in the community, you see what's going on and you gently work your way up. And, you know, that happens in traditional apprenticeship with woodworking and joinery and in, in music. I think we think of apprenticeship as more of a way of learning about music. And so... Um, I, I think this is a nice example that, that, that gives us some, some of the ideas. If we think about tailoring um, and somebody's in, you know, learning how to become a tailor, then they often start off with quite easy, but they are meaningful tasks. They're actually meaningful in the context of being a tailor. So doing the ironing, they're, they're actually contributing to what needs to be done in that tailor's. But um, it, it's a bit more than making the tea, I think, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and in they, they observe and they, they kind of acculturate to the way people talk about things. They can hear all the conversations going on. Um, and, you know, that's in, 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 the, in the apprenticeship literature, that's known as legitimate peripheral participation. They're not, they're not there actually doing the main jobs, but they're, they're contributing in a, legis a, a legitimate way. As they get kind of develop, they're given little tasks. So not like the whole problem to solve, not like the whole suit, but just can you do this buttonhole and they're observed doing that little buttonhole um, or a bit of cutting here, you know, these kind of things. Um, 
And you know, crucially, the master is always there watching what's going on and giving little bits of advice. Um, you know, are they making the right decisions? Are they actually applying the tools in a sensible way in the way that the culture does? You know, the, the culture of that profession, are they actually applying these rules appropriately? Um, and they're looking at intermediate results uh, along the way. So I think, I think you know, that, 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 that that's just one kind of vignette if you, if you th think of tailoring. Um, and and in, in, this, in this literature, they, they talk very much about um, these three components. So in any kind of craft discipline, you'll have the tools available to you. You'll have various activities that make use of the tools. And then there's a culture. And that's that kind of undefinable thing, which is the way those activities get put together. And I think it's, it's this acculturation that is the thing that we have trouble with in our subject. So, so let's just look at tools, activities, and culture as related to computing. So uh, tools, we've got our programming constructs, we've got our concepts, maybe we have ID, the, the IDE. These are the, these, these are the raw tools that we have to play with. Maybe we have a pseudocode that we can use. Um, so, so, so that's what we're using. And then we have a range of different kinds of activities. And think of these as really simple things. So perhaps it's just making an edit to a program or recompiling or just observing the output when you run the program. Just, just quite simple things, inspecting code, um, making a hypothesis about what might be wrong with the code. They're all the little activities that we do as programmers. Um, but there's no sense, when you just write down the activities, there's no sense of a sequence or an ordering of the way we put all those things together. Um, but the, the culture is a key bit, and I want to separate the idea of if we think about a novice culture compared to an expert culture, what do they look like? Now, you know, programming educators will often giggle about this kind of novice culture that we often see with our students. They run the program, they check the output, it's not what they want, they make some completely random edit that you can't understand at all, and they recompile and run again, and they just carry on in the hope that they're going to get there. And we all have a good giggle about that. Uh, <laughs> I saw other smiles around miles, you don't need to worry. Um, and they are, they are making use of the tools and the activities, but they're not doing it in the way an expert in our field would actually, would actually do that. So think about the expert in the same situation. They would run, they would check the output, it's not what they want. They would examine the code back against the problem statement. Um, maybe they'd add some diagnostic prints in. That's another of those useful little activities. They'd compile and run it again. Perhaps on the basis of the output, they'd develop a hypothesis for what might be wrong, but then they'd run it again, having ch carefully chosen the right input data to test their hypothesis, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know about this, you're programmers. That's the kind of things we do. Um, so so I, think, I think the key thing I'm trying to bring out of all of this is, is that there's, there's an acculturation that we need to try and achieve, which is you know, bringing these guys to see and understand and solve problems the way that we see them. And you can't teach that. You all know you can't teach that, and it's the thing we struggle with. You know, how do you get them to see a problem such that the algorithm falls out, and then you know, the appropriate ways of, of turning that algorithm into code and you know, the processes of debugging, they're all things that we can't, we haven't worked out a rigorous set of rules that we just say, you do it like this. Um, so, so the sad thing is that you see them applying all of those activities. They're just not doing it in a kind of sensible way. OK, so um, are, we, are we managing to do this as educators? Are, how far along the road are we of actually managing to do this kind of apprenticeship for, um, for, for, our, for our students? So um, I think not, personally. I talked about some of this last year, so I'm not going to labor it a lot. I, I fear rather a try it and see culture developing um, with languages like Scratch and Alice and App Inventor. Um, and I'm not targeting those in particular. I just think that those kind of languages, um, they, they kind of match up um, th this idea that we can learn about ICT and things at the surface. You know, it should be enough just to open up Word and I should be able to understand everything that Word does, just from the menus and stuff, just from the way it looks. I don't need to delve in and understand what's going underneath. I can understand it at the surface. Um, and whilst that was correct of Mac Wright, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, quite a lot of years ago. Um, I don't think it's true now of a modern word processor where the, where the system is so complex, you need to actually do some study in almost, almost to understand the model that you're trying to work against, you know, the document model. 
It's, it's not just presented on the screen. It's too, like, I don't understand how Word places pictures into documents. Well, exactly. No, yeah, so, so, so we need to study that. And, you know, there's all sorts of clever ways that we have of trying to hypothesize and work out how it's doing it. Um, well, you know, that's the kind of thing we do. We, you know, we try and work out what the underlying system is, and that's because we have those, that, that kind of brain. Anyway, so I think all I'm trying to say here is that, that um, we've, we, you know, our whole culture with really nice computers and great interfaces has been about can we just understand things at the surface. That's, that's the mark of a great interface. Um, but it's not really the kind of approach I want people to go about when they're doing programming. It would be like saying the tailor, just look, take the materials and have a go. You know, we're going to end up with some really bizarre bit of clothing, but that's really what we're saying if we, if we, if we have a try it and see culture. And I mean, I do feel that Scratch particularly emphasizes that culture. You know, that's really what they want people to be doing, just playing around. And I, I'm just sort of a bit worried about that. And there are some papers coming out from educators that suggest that Scratch does not, in fact, uh, embed good programming habits. You know, things end up just too small. Lots of tiny, tiny little bits of Scratch all peppered around the screen. Um, you know, the, the, that sense of precision and scale and the, the, the culture is not really coming out in, in the way Scratch is developing people. Um, this is uh, another one, emphasis of, of code writing over reading. This is really my, my biggest bugbear usually is I think that, that, that many people emphasize that it's all about solving problems and making things work. Um, and I agree there's a challenge here. I mean, over reading, reading seems boring. Reading code, oh my God, that sounds boring. So, so obviously there's a challenge there. How do we balance those two? But I think if you can't understand code, how can you possibly write it? So I don't, know how we, I don't know how we get that solved for 13 to 14-year-olds. And you know, I hope I'm not going to talk for too long. And I, I really, you know, I think that's one of the biggest difficulties is that I'm sort of coming at this from the academic point of view. You're right, I've got lots of keen, enthusiastic students, ha-ha, who will actually do what I want them to do. And then teachers say to me, oh, but Quentin, you're completely mad. That's never going to work in a classroom because blah, blah, blah. So, so I think there's a balance here. But, I, but I, think, I think if we can find ways of making it sort of fun to explore code rather than just make it, um, I think that's, that's kind of important. Um, and when it comes to assessing and following what they're doing, we tend to, this is what I talked about last year particularly, you know, we tend to look at the artifact before the process the students went through. We assess the finished artifact. That's ten, that tends to be what we look at. We kind of pay lip service to students producing documentation. Well, I know we don't pay lip service to it. The students pay lip service to documentation. They've done whatever they've done to get their program working, and then they go back and do the documentation. Yeah, we all know they do that. I mean, that's what they say, you know. Um, that works in the real world as well, doesn't it? <laughs> well, in large software engineering projects, yeah, I mean, you, you can't do it in large software engineering projects because you've got different teams working on things as well. I, I mean, you know, um, that may be true for small-scale coding. I don't think you could apply that to large-scale coding. I think you can. I've worked on quite a lot of things. Okay, well, I mean, I'm... I can't apply it to safety-critical code. No, okay. Thank God there's one area. So, 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 so let, let me step back. I don't care about documentation. I mean, actually, 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 I don't care about documentation. That's, that's not what I'm trying to get at in the talk, of course. I mean, what I'm trying to get at is that if we go back to the apprenticeship model, the apprenticeship model, the master is there watching all the time, helping, guiding, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in an industrial teaching model, we don't have the resources to be there alongside helping, guiding, and all of that sort of thing. So, so but, but nonetheless, we must do something about that issue because if we think of ourselves as a craft and we've got this complex skill to get over that we can't teach in the right way, we need to do what the apprentice people do, the, you know, the, um, the craft people do. So anything else I want to say there? No, I don't think so. Okay, so, so how could we bring some kind of element of apprenticeship into um, our classrooms? So what I talked about last year was very much this idea of, well, you know, we can't do one-on-one -on -one questioning of students because we don't have the resource for that. But can we get somewhere nearer that? And, and these kind of pedagogies, I talked about peer instruction particularly last year, but flip teaching is another phrase used, the Khan Academy, so on and so forth, where you basically get the students to 
do some kind of prep work that they can do, and this is what Ian was talking about last night in the Bring and Brag, if you came to that session, he actually tried some of this out. Um, you, you get the students to do what they can do on their own, um, and then the class time is much more about a discussion and um, uh, uh, engagement and, and actually talking about the subject. Um, and so, um, you know, my sort of touchstone course for this was one that I developed with uh, Beth Simon in, in uh, California. Lots and lots of students uh, now being piloted in schools and teachers getting training on how to use that same pedagogy out in the schools. Um, based on Alice with peer instruction. Um, and it really is about trying to get the, the, the pupils um, seeing and understanding problems and code in the same way that we do. Now, just quickly, I don't want to labor this too much, but, but the basic, so, so that's the basic framework. They go and do stuff on their own. There's a quiz when they come into the class to make sure they've done it. So um, Ian said last night, he just had a look at the students' workbooks to make sure they'd actually done the work. Um, and then you go into uh, um, a classroom framework where um, basically you ask the students questions about what they've done in order to drill down and make, get their understanding deeper. And so uh, essentially ask them an MCQ vote, they, a question, they can, all, they can all vote on that and then have a discussion in fixed groups of three so the students discuss with each other. Yes? Can I, sorry, can I just ask, why have you settled on three uh, and, and not two? Does it sort of move them out to an education to do pairs and groups of three? Triad. Oh, there's a move in education to move to pairs so away from... There, there is a, a parallel uh, working system where you, you get students to work in pairs. I'd, I wonder whether there was a research that said working in three is better than working in... No, no I, I couldn't necessarily answer you. I just know that peer instruction has, has typically always been done in threes. And I, I think the argument is that you get more different viewpoints on an issue, but not too many that everybody can't, can't have to say. So if you had four or five, that would be too many. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's not, it's not about a consensus. It's you, um, one of the keys with this is you want people to be talking about the subject matter. Because if you can't talk about it, you don't understand it. That's my kind of view. You know? So you want them to practice actually using the language of the subject. I mean, how, you know, we all know that our language is terribly arcane and strange to students. You know? We want them practicing using the language because that's one way of getting inside. You know, one of the kind of apprenticeship models I sometimes think about is when I was learning to be a scuba diver at university. So one part of it was actually doing the training in the pool. But a fundamentally crucial part of it was to go to the pub afterwards and listen to all the old farts like I became later, pontificating about all the great dives we'd done, using all the terminology, just picking it up, imbuing it, you know. And, and I think that the, 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 the brilliant thing about this framework is it, it forces students to be talking about the terminology, you know, using the terminology. Um, partly they're practicing it amongst themselves and then you have another vote and then you, you open into a class-wide discussion about it. And so then students hear other students across the room talking about it. And eventually, you get the kind of way it's modeled by the expert. And the expert talks about the problem the way they see it. And so there's been so much priming in the preparatory work, in the discussion, well, in thinking about your first vote, and then in the discussion, that when the final you know, teacher comes along and does that final piece, it's, it's um, um, yeah, you know, they're really prepared to hear the way the master talks about it as well. Anyway, I didn't want to talk too much about that because... What I have seen, just to, to interrupt, yeah. in some primary schools is actually making the screencasts and the flipping themselves, so they actually do construct it and reconstruct it in terms of media as well. So they explain how they put the thing yeah, together so and how it works. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that, that's right. And so they're, they're actually talking about what they've done rather than, rather than the kind of experimental, try it and see, put it together, but I couldn't explain to you how I did it, but look, there it is, isn't it great? So they're forced then to actually synthesize. That's right, so that's, that's, so, okay, so what you're saying is that's a doing first culture, but they're forced to talk about what they then did, okay. Um, right, so a key factor in this that I want to talk about in this session, because I talked about that uh, peer instruction more last year, but in this session I want to talk about the, the multiple choice questions themselves, and um, I don't think we particularly realised what we were doing when we put these questions together in the first place. We'd love to tell you it was the other way around and we had a complete plan and it was all, you know. But, but over years of developing these kind of questions, because both Beth and I have used techniques like this for a number of, of years, um, I think we must have just sort of somehow got into our heads the kind of questions that really work in this sense of forcing students to think and work as the experts do. Um, so we had hundreds of these questions by the time the course was finished. And 
when we analyzed them, we were kind of fascinated to see the nature of these questions. You know, so this, this taxonomy has emerged out of the questions, which are kind of separated by the fact that we very much see the use of differing levels of abstraction. Well, that's kind of, you'd expect that in computing questions, but often that doesn't happen. But very much um, uh, different levels of abstraction. And the fact that the questions were very often, the question might be framed at one level of abstraction, but the answer expected is uh, another level of abstraction. And of course, you know, if you can't see and appreciate the same problem at different levels of abstraction, you're just, you're just nowhere in computing, because that's what it's all about. So, um, so we saw these levels, we saw the transitions. Um, we also saw that there were questions that were just saying, can you do it? You know, can you actually hand execute this code to do this thing? Can you tell me what this code is actually doing? That kind of thing. But also, we had uh, kind of rationale questions about explaining why something was the way it was. Why had somebody picked this construct to do such and such? And these kind of things. So getting at that slightly more difficult knowledge about, about um, why an expert would have set up a piece of code the way they had, or, or something like that. OK, so um, the abstraction levels are fairly, you, you might have expected this, that there's the level of the problem statement. We just called that English. There was kind of CS speak in the middle. So that's the kind of language you might use in, in writing plans or talking about your solution to somebody else. You, know, you, you wouldn't necessarily go right down to the code level, talk about your solution, but you'd talk about the concepts and constructs. So we're going to have a loop here to do this, and it's going to go around five times and blah, blah, blah. So there's a, there's a kind of middle language, which is really about, well, do I, do I have the lingo of the subject? You know, um, and, then, and then we have the code. Um, and then lots of transitions, you've got them in the handout. But, but basically, every possible transition came out in the, in the kind of questions, you know, when, when we looked at these questions. Uh, and let's, we'll look at some questions in just a minute. But um, essentially, you know, uh, uh, a 1, 3 would be a typical programming question. Here's the problem, can you give me the code for it? Um, slightly more unusual problem, uh, but we're seeing this emerging more and more, is, is a 3, 1. OK, here's some code. Can you tell me what the problem is that it solves? That requires some quite complex skills. Um, but then there's kind of everything in between. A, a standard tracing question is just a three or a three to three because you're presenting them some code and you're saying, what's the output from this code? Well, that's kind of still at the code level in a way. So we, we think of that one as a three, three. Um, and then you know, we did come across definitional questions, sort of like, you know, uh, what's the purpose of a for loop um, kind of questions. Um, and, and also, um, to, to apply, were, were sort of um, given this plan, how would you break down that step or something? And then, then you've got to give an answer, which is also at that kind of planning level. OK, so all, all of these transitions, and as I say, we, we separated also some into how and some as why questions. So really, questions asking about mechanism or asking about rationale. So let, let's just have a look at some of these questions, because it's sort of easier to, to talk through them. So I'm going to go to the same set of questions that you've got just there. Um, full screen. Well, it always does that. Right, so let's make this. Let's make this. Page right. OK, so is this going to work? How do I go down? That's not very useful, is it? OK, well, let's forget that then. Oh, well, how do I get out? Exit. I thought that would be a good way to look. Right, well, we'll just look at them straight in Word. OK, so, so that first question there. Now, just to, just to explain, these questions derived from, um, from Alice, um, but we're trying to present them in a more language-neutral way, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but this is, a, this is essentially a pseudocode. Um, but we wanted to be able to capture the fact that we could still be working with graphical, you know, we could be working in graphical contexts or textual contexts or, or whatever. So, so um, here, this is, this is a 3-1. This is in the research literature, sometimes called an explain in plain English question. Sorry, I've probably moved too far across. No, OK. Uh, explain in plain English. And um, so um, we've given them a piece of code, basically. We've set the context here. We've got an array of uh, little sprites. And um, we've got some functions that work over those sprites. And we're basically just asking them, what does that piece of code do? And you'll see that popping out in the question is obviously code. And the answer stems are up at the problem level. It's like, well, what's the, what's the problem this is uh, solving? Well, all the sprites will jump. All the sprites that are red will jump. 
And so you can see that this is, this, is, you know, this is definitely quite a complex application question. They've actually got to look carefully at the code and work out what the test is doing and what's happening in the move and is this applying to all the sprites or just some of them and so on and so forth in order to work out which one of these answer options is correct. Now I think people often object to multiple choice questions because they say well you can only use them for recall. But actually I think you know, these, qu these questions show that they're being used for something quite a lot more complex than that. Yes. Yeah. So, do you think you can get from that to actually another step to actually being able to explain yourself what's the difference? Okay, so. Skills, recognizing the right explanation. Absolutely. Okay, so, so, um, so what you're saying is that, that I might be able to pick the right answer, but I couldn't articulate to you why I've picked the right answer. Or, or be able to actually come up with that answer yourself. In fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so. No, it's, no I, I, I get what you're saying. Okay, so, so if we look at the spectrum of formative sort of assessment, you know, the kind of training learning period through to summative assessment, then um, a question like this used in that kind of discussion format where students practice with each other to explain it, they're, they're practicing how to justify because one of the students may have come up with D and another one may have come up with B and the whole point of the discussion session, you know, the thing as a teacher that you're trying to exhort is well, get to your deepest understanding of this to explain why, why B is right and D is wrong or whatever it might be. So, so, so in, in, in the teaching phase or learning phase, um, you can still use a question like this, but you want to have that kind of discussion element. Um, if you are then going to go on and assess, the easiest way, what you're getting at is, is can a student explain the why, really? Because... You're, you're not assessing this directly, no. You're right that when I use peer instruction, you're hoping that the why is happening in the background and they're learning about it. If you use this question directly in summative assessment, you're right, you wouldn't be getting at the why. So you could reframe this in two ways. You could just simply make it uh, a short answer question, in which case the student's got to be able to come up with the answer. You still don't necessarily have the why unless you said explain your reasoning. Um, another option, uh, a way of turning any how question like this into a why question is simply to say, pick the right answer and explain your reasoning. Why do you think yours is right and the other one's wrong? I mean, the same thing they're doing in a discussion, and they've got to do it, just, just write it down. Um, and in fact, we have done that in exam situations where we've taken a multiple choice question and we've asked them to explain it. And I mean, they're not trivial to mark, which of course is one of the reasons why you might want to go too near it. But, but actually, you know, so it's quite clear. Some of them can give you fantastic answers that explain exactly why this is right. They, they, they've got the lingo, they understand everything, and some aren't quite there yet. You know, so it's a, it is a good way of really sorting out um, what they know. Okay, so there's, there's a one example of a 1-3 question, that second one. Um, in this case, one of the things that these questions allow you to do is to hone quite finely in on particular pieces. So this one is just saying, well, what expression needs to go in here in order to solve the problem of changing all the sprites in the array that are more than two meters high to be half their height. So um, you've just got to, I mean, I could have done that more efficiently. G given that the only thing that changes is that, maybe I should have had this so that you've actually got get height sprite pick correct operator uh, two or something. But I mean, I could write that many ways. But, but uh, so, so you've got, you've got one threes there. Um, an example of um, what we were just talking about there, Paul, would be uh, this question right at the end that you've got there um, is one where we haven't given it as multiple choice. We give them a scenario. You've got a piece of code that we've been working on together. Um, and so I'm, I'm asking you to explain whether the code is right or wrong and, and give me a justification. Um, and so the plan is that this monkey should come to the bottom of the skyscraper, climb up it some way, and then fall back down to Earth. And we've got an explanation of what some of these uh, functions are doing. Um, and so we're just looking for an explanation there. And, and in fact, that was, you know, that was one we actually asked in an exam. And um, as I say, we had a, we had a, a broad range of um, answers. They were quite hard to mark. Um, in a sense, they weren't too hard to mark because as, as soon as you'd marked a few of them, you then develop your rubric for it, and you, you know, in, in the usual kind of way. Uh, 
there, number seven, standard tracing question, just explain what's going to happen as the output of this piece of code. Um, let's look at more challenging ones, three to two Y here. So we've got a piece of code and then we're kind of asking, was the author correct to use a repeat times loop? So the, the question is in terms of code, um, but the answer has to do with being able to explain um, up at the level of concepts in computer science. Um, so that, and, and there's a few more examples in there that you can um, take a look at.